Welcome to the Washington Stormwater Center's Lunchtime Municipal Webinar Series. Today we are delighted to present Lisa Rosman and Dr. Jen McIntyre, who are going to talk about municipal stormwater and its various and sundry effects. All right, thanks everyone for coming to our webinar today. I'm going to give a, an overview of stormwater um, from both a municipal and a business um, perspective. And then Jen is going to talk more specifically about salmon and the effects of stormwater on salmon. So just getting started here, some of the stormwater discussion topics that we're going to talk about today. What is stormwater? Why is it a problem? What are the effects of stormwater pollution? Where does it all go? And that's an important messaging um, when you're talking to the public. Where does that pollution go? So we'll talk about a little bit about messaging of that. What are the effects of too much runoff? So that's a quantity issue rather than a quality issue. And we'll also discuss traditional stormwater management and low impact development. So what is polluted runoff? I know you guys all know what it is, but if you think about it, it's basically it's rain and precipitation that hits the ground and picks up pollution and runs off into the nearest water body. But I'd also like to talk just briefly about what isn't stormwater, because sometimes people think of anything that goes into a storm drain as stormwater. So thinking about like processed wastewater is not stormwater, pressure washing water is not stormwater, um, any water that comes out of a hose is not really stormwater, because it doesn't come from the sky, right? So so that's regulated, but it's regulated a little differently. And just because it goes into a storm drain does not mean that that is stormwater. I really like the message of only rain down the drain. So it's taken me a while to get to the point where I sort of understand stormwater. It's been, it's been years since I've been dealing with it. But when I first started dealing with it, I was a hazardous waste inspector for the Department of Ecology. And so I was doing compliance and enforcement at businesses that generated hazardous waste. And of course, you know, with my bias, I always thought, well, that's you know, the most important thing that ecology can, can regulate. And so my first exposure to the industrial stormwater general permit was, what? I, I, I don't really understand. I, I don't understand how we can regulate this. And so my initial thoughts were, we're going to regulate rain? and Aren't businesses burdened enough without having to deal with something that they have no control over? Don't they have more important things to think about? You know, we're putting these burdens on these businesses and municipalities. How much is this going to cost them? And doesn't EPA have better things to do? And it's just rain, for goodness sakes. You know, what, what are we doing here? But then I got schooled. And I really like this picture because it's so peaceful and, and looks like you know a pastoral setting. But really what happened was I had to sit down with some of the inspectors. And they taught me a lot about what stormwater is and why it's a problem. So stormwater is a problem for a couple of reasons. And it's that quality that we talk about, that pollution that gets into the stormwater. But it's also the quantity and that erosion and flooding that it can, can, that it can cause. So that was the, my first experience, like, OK, you know, I've got to get kind of a handle on this. There's two reasons that, e that ecology is regulating these things. And they're regulating them in different ways. So then I learned that there's this third reason, and that's the economic impacts that it has on our environment and our state and our cities. And by not paying attention to or planning for those stormwater impacts, it impairs the value of your investments in stormwater infrastructure, in drinking water. And the number one business attractor and people, why people want to live here is that quality of life, that, um, that recreation piece that, that we talk so much about here in Washington. So a couple of examples of those economic impacts. Um, Burlington Northern agreed to pay $2.5 million to settle uh, stormwater discharge violations. And one of our own municipalities, Clark County, had to pay $3.6 million for violating the Clean Water Act. So those economic impacts are real, and we need to pay attention to those. We want people to come to our cities and our counties and start businesses and have that economic driver, but we need to pay attention to stormwater as one of the things that is important in order to attract those businesses and, and, um, and economic drivers. So the culprits, I mean, it, it's everywhere. It's, it's not just a, ha per, a, a business mismanaging their hazardous waste, like I was thinking of when I first started thinking about stormwater. There is no potentially liable party. It's everyone's responsibility. So getting your head around that is a little difficult, because it's impervious surfaces. It's aerial deposition. It comes from wood stoves and car exhaust. 
um, roadways, building materials that we use can sometimes cause stormwater issues. So it's household products and practices that we talk to citizens about, you know, how to properly use pesticides if you're going to, how to use those fertilizers properly. And again, it, it's everywhere. It's not something that you can point at and say, here is the one culprit that's causing those pollution problems. So the pollutions of, of concern, pollutants of concern that we talk about most, metals, suspended solids, nutrients, how acidic or basic the water is in order for um, aquatic life to survive, turbidity, which is just basically the cloudiness in the water that, um, that sometimes causes problems for fish, and oil and grease from cars. Other issues might be um, uh, fats, oil, and greases that get into our stormwater drains from restaurants not being cleaned properly, um, dumping their oil or washing their mop water out into the street. So we have a lot of issues to deal with. Some of the sneaky ones that you can't see, those invisible sources of pollutants, tires and galvanized surfaces all have zinc in them. And it's an accumulation of all of those things. It's not just one chain link fence, but if you think about chain link fences being pretty ubiquitous, and unless they're coated, they're, they're leaching zinc out. So zinc is one of those sneaky, invisible pollutants that we have to deal with. Copper, again, brake pads are being uh, phased out in Washington, but we still have a lot of brake pads that are, that are causing some dust in the um, stormwater, and Jen's going to talk more about that. Um, Anti-fouling paints also being phased out, but still a problem. Um, and exposed copper surfaces, I, my neighbor, you know, believe it or not, I, um, <laughs> my neighbors just put a copper roof on um, part of their house, and it's beautiful. It looks great, but their storm drains, I know, directly discharge into Watershed Park in, in Olympia. So um, <laughs> that's another thing to be concerned about. Again, you know, um, suspended solids are a problem. Um, they get tracked in. They're from construction sites. And they can cause a problem because they can smother the, the aquatic life. They can get into the storm drain and into the surface water and cause um, multiple issues. OK, so pollution problems. These are the things that we talk about stormwater has a problem with, and that is human health and recreation. And again, human health. Areas closed to swimming, areas closed for shellfishing. I just recently learned I have a friend that lives in Long Beach, California, and every time it rains, the ocean gets, the beaches get closed because of all of the pollution that is coming out of those storm drains. So they just automatically close the beaches. So that, that again, hurts our economic um, resources. More pollution problems, aquatic life. Those nutrients, nutrients are a good thing, right? It's something we need for life, and we need to um, make sure that we have enough nutrients. But it can also cause a problem in that algal blooms um, can suck up all the oxygen that fish need to breathe. It impairs salmon's ability to detect predators and benthic organisms, those um, bugs and, and small um, insect-like life in the water that other fish and salmon need to survive are impaired as well. So. Where does all that pollution go? And I think the messaging, any messaging that we have surrounding stormwater, for everyone, you know, I gave a presentation to some middle schoolers yesterday, and they didn't know, of course, they, they just had no idea about stormwater. But even, you know, adults often just, they, it's not something they think about. It goes into this pipe or it goes into the storm drain, and they don't know where it goes, and they think that it gets treated. A lot of folks still think that it goes to the treatment plant. So that stormwater system versus the sanitary sewer, I think, is a very important message. We need to make sure that when we're talking about stormwater that we know that most of it goes untreated to the nearest water body. And the other important message there is that even if you're miles away from any surface water, the Columbia River, the ocean, a river, Spokane River, Puget Sound, if it goes into a pipe, it usually discharges into a water body. So the messages that I enjoy are Puget Sound starts here. It doesn't start down there. It doesn't start you know, where the shoreline ends. It starts here. I think that's a really great, great messaging. I'm going to put in a little plug for one of our videos called Storm Trek, which talks about how even miles away you put something in a storm grain, and it's going to end up in Puget Sound or the nearest water body. And more messaging information, the Sightline Institute in Seattle has a great how to talk about stormwater messaging file that I have put the URL for here. 
very good, very well thought out. Just how to talk to people about stormwater. You and I do it every day, but when it's something that, like when I back when I was a hazardous waste inspector, I just had no idea that stormwater was such a big deal. So what does the data say? The previous municipal permits required phase one municipalities to monitor their outfalls and submit that data to ecology. And so ecology took that data and they wrote a report. So this is the URL for that Department of Ecology report on the results from all of that monitoring and all of those, all of those dollars that were spent to monitor our stormwater in cities, phase one cities, um, has now been compiled. And you can look at that and get an idea of what is, what is really in our stormwater from these municipal areas. All right, another important thing to think about is source control and tracing. It's far, far easier to prevent pollution in the stormwater than it is to remove it afterwards. And sometimes we have to do a little of both. But I think overall, um, and again, this is from a business perspective, so because I deal primarily with businesses, there's a lot of housekeeping issues that I see when I go out to visit businesses that um, you know they could do a whole lot more if they were to just look at the sources and know that even in small amounts, those things can add up to big pollution issues. So you got to know those sources and be able to identify them. And you know, an example of that that I gave before was the chain link fence. It equals zinc. And if you have a lot of chain link fence and it rains, um, you're going to have some leaching of zinc. So that's another example. But those sneaky invisible pollutants, we I'm going to put another plug in for our, um, our stormwater centers video we just launched our source tracing video and it, some case studies from businesses and municipalities on how they went about finding those last little bits of, you know, where is this coming from? We, I still have a zinc problem. I have treatment and I still have a zinc problem. Where is that coming from? So I think that will help um, if you take a look at that. I think you'll enjoy it. And then there's BMPs for prevention and if needed treatment. And there was a question that came in before about the approved treatment BMPs for municipalities. So municipalities, I think you guys maybe already know this, but you have to use BMPs that have been approved by the Department of Ecology. And so they have to go through a protocol of testing, and it's called the TAPE program. It's a protocol for testing and approval of those treatment BMPs that are used by municipalities. Keep in mind, if you're a business, and you are covered under the industrial stormwater permit, you don't necessarily have to use these approved BMPs. You can actually use, oh, thanks, Jen. OK, so the uh, it's, um, technology approval protocol ecology, actually, is that last word. Because ecology does get the last, the last say on what's approved and what's not. So the protocol for testing, they have to go through a series of testing to make sure that what they say their BMP is going to do actually um, does do that. And the information is on Ecology's website about what, ha what has been approved, what's going through the process, um, what has been conditionally approved, and what's still in the testing process. There is a move to have a nationalized tape sort of program so that if you have a, a widget, a BMP, that you want to be able to use in more than one state, that you don't have to get approval in each of those jurisdictions, that you can just have one to cover the entire United States. And that's being worked on now through um, Water Environment Federation, I think, is the lead on that. And they are they're working toward that because it makes a lot of sense economically and um, just ease of municipalities knowing what's, um, what they can use and what they can't. All right, so the other issue that I learned about way back in the 90s was that too much water can also be a problem. So too much stormwater running off of all of that impervious surface that we have causes damage to the streams. It blows them out. There's erosion. There's street, stream side vegetation damage. There's a loss of shade that's needed for habitat. And there's a loss of habitat in general. The dirt from all that erosion smothers aquatic life and can cause problems for things like salmon nests. It can cover them. They need clear, cool, fresh water with lots of gravel and not a lot of sediment. And if they have too much sediment, it just smothers those eggs. So again, erosion and sediment control, you know, from minor soil erosion that you can kind of get your handle, get a handle on, to um, another example of an economic issue. A Sumner Construction Company a few years ago pled guilty to pollution crimes. They actually had been warned a number of times they did not follow ecology's um, regulations and ended up taking out an entire highway up in the Auburn area. And the owner of the business did some jail time because of it. 
you know, that's um, not only an erosion and sediment control problem for the environment, but also for the people that wanted to get to work that day and couldn't use that road. Um, so we need to think about those things when we're designing our stormwater programs. And flooding, urban flooding is a problem because of the amount of impervious surface are, that's increasing. Our systems were not designed for that much impervious surface, right? So too much impervious area, and the pipes aren't not being big enough. Also, lack of maintenance, lack of cleaning and, and raking the drains and jetting the pipes, even more problems with capacity in the system. And so too much rain and lack of maintenance, lack of capacity in the storm. Um, and then if you have a sto high storm surge, a high tide, you know, you can get things like this. This is in Olympia during a, you know, high tide and a high rain event causing some, some flooding. And again, back to economics, that causes some property damage and, um, and problems for the environment and problems for people. So our traditional way of managing stormwater was to get it out of there as fast as they can with as little damage as possible. And getting rid of that water meant that, you know, we used curb and gutter, we used, um, and we still do, we use curb and gutters and we use outfalls. We just want to get rid of that water. And we've been doing it this way for a very long time. Um, in fact, a few years ago I was in Italy, I went to Pompeii, and you see the impervious surface here and the curb and the gutters flowing down into Naples Bay to get rid of that water as fast as possible. And then traditional stormwater containment and treatment, it's very expensive, uses a large amount of land, and so rethinking how we manage our water, how we treat our water, how can we do a better job of protecting that valuable resource, and valuable as in Again, back to the economics, a huge amount of money is being used to manage our water. And it's the economy and health of, of people all over the world depend on water, right? From, you know, livestock and crop production, recreation, drinking water. It's a valuable resource for a number of reasons, right? If we don't have it, we are not going to live very long. So we need to rethink how we're, how we're managing those things. And low impact development is one of those ways that we can kind of rethink our management, right? So low impact development basically is trying to make this with almost 100% impervious surface behave like this, like a, like a sponge where it soaks into the ground and then the, um, the microbes in the soil and the plants take up those pollutants. So here's the LID concepts. It's mimicking that hi natural hydrology, which is like before impervious surface or without impervious surface. It's that natural hydrology where there's plants and soil and, and trees. Infiltration, filtering that water, detaining that water, slowing it down so that it's not a problem for blowing out creeks, um, recharging that groundwater, evaporation, control and treatment near the source instead of sending it downstream like um, with curb and gutter and pipes. Um, don't concentrate those flows so we're, we don't have as much flooding and using plants to remove contaminants. And originally, LID techniques, and, and when this first came about I was still at Ecology and talking about LID techniques, it was primarily for flow control, so for preventing too much water from getting into those creeks. And so it helps with urban flooding because it infiltrates. But now we are finding that not only is it a flow control technique, it's also fantastic for treatment and for removing those pollutants. And Jen's going to talk about that in just a minute. So some examples of LID, it's also referred to as green stormwater infrastructure. I don't know where we're at with the um, LID versus GSI, but um, I think we can use those interchangeably currently. Let's see, so these are the kinds of, of LID examples that we have today. And I threw this picture in of the goats on this green roof because I just thought it was, it was funny and cute. I liked it. So biotension rain gardens, again, preventing flooding, um, mimicking that natural hydrology, infiltrating that water. Porous asphalt and permeable concrete. We have sections of both of those, for example, and research here at WSU. And that is pretty much the end of my, my discussion. You know, again, Jen is going to talk a little bit more in depth about these things. And 
Um, a question just came up. Oh, tree retention. Yes, tree retention is important. So our current way of doing things is to, if you're going to have a development, you just mow down the entire thing, which is what happened just recently um, near this, this campus. But tree retention is important, you know, um, for evapotranspiration and for just maintaining some semblance of that natural hydrology. Hello, everybody. I also like goats. Love that roof with goats on it. I've seen that in uh, Door County, Wisconsin. I'll be talking to you today about um, the toxicity side of stormwater runoff, why it's a problem, and, and um, what we think we're going to be able to do about it in terms of low impact development. So Lisa already showed you some of these concepts. For example, that this is not a forest, um, and therefore it doesn't act like one when it rains. The water simply has nowhere to go but run off into usually the nearest water uh, the nearest water body, picking up contaminants as it goes. And this is what that looks like underwater. If you haven't seen this footage before, it's uh, taken by Laura James, who's a, a diver and an independent contractor in, um, in Seattle. This is taken off of Alki Beach uh, during, a, uh, during a, a rain event. And it's basically just accumulated stormwater runoff from all of the uh, you know, residential and urban areas up um, uphill in the watershed, and that's what it looks like underwater. And this this film actually goes on through the night um, as the rainwater continues to trickle runoff down into the um, outflow systems. So from the top down, this is what we see when there's stormwater pollution entering a water body. And what we're seeing is that turbidity. We're seeing suspended solids. What we're not seeing is um, many of the contaminants that, that I am concerned about as an aquatic toxicologist. That's what we'll focus on in today's, <coughs> in today's talk, is the effect of those invisible contaminants, as Lisa called them. So the reason we care about this, ultimately, the reason we regulate stormwater at all, is because we do care about the receiving bodies, the ecosystems that are on the receiving end of stormwater runoff. And, um, you know, we value uh, what they provide for us, uh, if not for the animals that, uh, that live there. So here's a beautiful photograph of, um, beautiful, I'm perhaps biased because I'm a fish biologist also, um, baby salmon. So they will feature in this talk <coughs> periodically um, as we come in and out of different research threads. So for many years, we have been, uh, we've been using coho salmon as a sentinel for stormwater impacts. Um, this is because in our research with, uh, at WSU, we work really closely with US Fish and Wildlife Service. And also, we partner with NOAA Fisheries. So coho salmon are um, very common throughout the Pacific Northwest, particularly in lowland streams. And of course, that's, uh, that's where um, humans like to put their developments as well. So there's a lot of potential for overlap in habitat. They also spend a lot of time in fresh water compared to many of the other Pacific salmon species. Um, a full year of their life is spent in fresh water between hatching out and when, they, um, and when they head out to the ocean. OK, so I'm going to give two examples from our decade plus now of research looking at stormwater impacts in the field. So an integrated look at impacts on coho salmon. This uh, highlighting I just showed in pink is the, is the half of the coho uh, life cycle that is spent in fresh water from when they return as adults through to when they smolt out and um, head, to, head out to the salt. So the first example is for adult spawners. And I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot of people have heard of pre-spawn mortality in um, coho salmon that we've been documenting in this region for perhaps 15 years. And what it is simply is, is uh, a very high prevalence of pre-spawning mortality, so mortality before the fish get a chance to spawn. They return to the urban creeks to, to lay their eggs, and we expect them to die after they spawn, but they're, they're dying before they can spawn. Um, and um, at very high rates, sometimes up to 100% of the run, usually more like 60 to 90% of the run will have died prematurely. And before this happens, we see a suite of, um, a suite of toxic symptoms, uh, symptoms of toxicity, rather. And uh, it's throughout the region. We study this extensively in several systems in Puget Sound. But anecdotally, we hear of this happening all the way up in southern British Columbia and all the way south into northern California. 
linked to urban development. <clears throat> so the fish lose equilibrium, they become disoriented, uh, they splay their fins and they do this surface swimming and gaping, um, uh, looking a bit like suffocation perhaps, although it's not a dissolved oxygen problem. And these symptoms are followed closely by mortality. Uh, this is a paper that we wrote and published in 2011. It's available open access from the Public Library of Science. And what it does is just document uh, almost a decade of this research and forensically try to understand what's happening. It's not oxygen levels. It's not temperature. It's not any one contaminant that's standing out as, as above any, um, any sort of limit. Uh, and it is linked to the timing of rain events. So toxic urban stormwater runoff does seem the most likely uh, explanation. All right, second example from Coho Life Cycle is embryo development. So at Longfellow Creek, we have a bit of an outdoor laboratory there. And one season, we, we raised some coho embryos in the creek water of Longfellow Creek, which receives you know, in, in the wintertime at least, m almost all of its, al almost all of its flow is from stormwater runoff. <laughs> so it's, um, we see a lot of pre-spell mortality there. So uh, we had two treatments. In one was just the regular creek water, not filtered. The other one we, we experimentally filtered with a, a series of uh, sand filtration, activated carbon, and um, charcoal. And then we raised coho embryos in those different waters. And they weren't in an aquaria, that's just to show the you know, basically what the water looks like. Um, it was in a flow through straight, <coughs> straight out of the creek, filtered or not filtered, continuous flow. All right, and here's how those embryos looked at the end of development, uh, at least the end of the experiment. In the filtered water, they look pretty normal, as we would expect a, a healthy looking fish to, to look at this, this period of development, with about 10% of the fish abnormal or in some way or had died at this point of develop, by this point of development. In the, um, Sorry, that was in the, yeah, in the filtered creek water. And in the regular urban creek water, not filtered, 75% uh, of them had either died or were abnormal in some way. They're obviously smaller in this uh, stereotypical picture here. And then the arrow is pointing to um, cranial hemorrhaging, so blood spots in the head of that developing embryo. The second picture that I've overlain is a top-down view. And in the top one, I'm showing uh, that embryo developing in the filtered creek water, and you see what we expect, which is this uh, lovely symmetrical pattern of vasculature in the head region, whereas in the unfiltered, regular, straight pass uh, urban creek water, uh, we do not see that, instead just some random blood spots. All right, so those were those integrated impacts in the real world, um, and what we then did several years later, about four or five years now, is, is start to take that out of the field and into the lab so that we could uh, study it in a controlled way. So we wanted to know what's in the urban runoff, you know, add to the knowledge of, of the chemistry of urban runoff. How toxic is it? What are some tests that we could develop to, to really identify and characterize what that toxicity is, what it looks like? And then finally, uh, applying green stormwater infrastructure principles, could we prevent that toxicity? We started off by gathering highway runoff. We knew it would be a concentrated source of a lot of the pollutants we're concerned about across different land uses. And we have access to this elevated section of highway in Seattle, where there's a downspout right into uh, the parking lot of one of our uh, research collaborators. So we started collecting this runoff, characterizing it both chemi chemically and biologically. I'm not going to show the, the chemistry data today. I'll, I'll um, refer you to the papers where we've published that data. But of course, as one might expect, it contains a lot of metals and a lot of hydrocarbons, um, also some nutrients. What I want to talk now about is, is that biological impact. So here I'm showing you zebrafish as a research model. Um, and that's kind of our, our go-to aquatic lab rat. It's a really common research model in medical research, actually. So um, toxicologically, they respond very similar to humans. So there's actually a lot known about this animal. And uh, it can be incredibly useful because they're completely geno genetically sequenced. And there are a lot of uh, biomarkers that, that you can rapidly develop to target certain research questions. They're also clear as they develop. So you can watch, uh, you can watch things you wouldn't normally be able to see in other animal models. So uh, development is fairly rapid. You get a heartbeat around 24 hours, uh, hatching around two days, 
Um, and their swim bladder inflates, and in the bottom picture here of the fish that's, that's no longer in its chorion, in its eggshell at 96 hours, you can see that big circle of, of inflated uh, swim bladder or air bladder. So some of the very typical effects we would see across different storm events, varying in magnitude, but uh, present across different storm events, were an inability, an inability to hatch or a delay in hatching, developmental delays in that the fish were smaller, and this is fairly common if you have a, a metabolic demand from trying to detoxify contaminants in your environment. Um, a small eye phenotype that that asterisk is pointing to, into the smaller eye that develops as a result of um, uh, perhaps cardiovascular toxicity or maybe direct uh, neurological development interference. And finally, these arrows here, the yellow arrows pointing to pericardial edema. So the heart is in here, so this is the cardial area. So the pericardial area is swollen. There's fluid accumulating around the heart. And the same thing happens in humans who have um, congestive heart failure, for example. And then finally, the example on the right is from a storm event that, that was very concentrated in contaminants. You see the, the severe pericardial edema. You can actually also see deformities of the heart itself and, and craniofacial deformities. And those tend to be linked to this cardiovascular toxicity. I have some videos here, which is always useful to demonstrate these points. The top images are um, zebrafish that are 24 hours old, and the bottom images are uh, another two days older. So just two different de developmental time points. On the left in the green box are, are control fish. So this is what a normal zebrafish should look like. And you can't see the two chambers of its heart necessarily, but you should be able to see the blood moving from one chamber into the other. So that's, that's what's normal. The heart forms a tube. As it develops, it forms into two separate chambers. And then finally, those chambers have to loop in a certain way for the rest of development to, pro to progress normally. And that's what we see is interfered with often with stormwater exposure. So the rest of these images are fish that have been exposed to stormwater runoff. And uh, we'll see a, a variety of toxic impacts on the cardiovascular system. So for example, the pericardial edema, that swelling around the heart. The membrane should be close right up against the heart, and in here it's not. Uh, we see blood pooling behind the heart, waiting to enter. It's not being drawn in and passed through the heart the way it's supposed to. We also see, um, occasionally we see this cranial hemorrhaging, just like in the coho embryos that were exposed to urban creek water. And finally, um, this is an example of one of those very severely affected individuals with the severe pericardial edema. And you can actually see that the heart, even though it has two chambers that are pumping, um, those chambers, well, I can tell you, those chambers have not looped properly. They should be at right angles to each other instead of a straight line. Um, you know, along the central line of the fish like they are in this picture. All right, so one of the things we wanted to do after starting to learn more about stormwater runoff toxicity through our, um, through our zebrafish model was see with whether in the coho salmon we could recreate what we see in the field. We actually tried the first year we did this to make a synthetic cocktail containing a variety of metals and some um, hydrocarbons, some polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so PAHs. I'll be talking about those a little bit later. So PAH is not PH. And when we made that cocktail and exposed the adult salmon to it, nothing happened. Uh, no sick fish and no mortality. So there's something in the runoff itself that, that we were not mimicking with our cocktail. So what we did is uh, th this research takes place out at Grover's Creek, in, where the Suquamish tribe, op tribe operates a hatchery. And they're very generous in letting us work with their fish out there. Now the fish enter rapidly out of the sound up into Miller Bay, so it's a short section before they're in the fresh water. And this, this mimics the situation we see at, out at Longfellow Creek, where we've done so much research in the past. So they don't have a long migration through fresh water that, that would make it you know, possibly confounding if you didn't see the same results. Um, this hatchery is uh, largely for chum and chinook, but they also receive coho from net pen operations out in Miller Bay. That's why we're able to use them. So we brought stormwater runoff that we collected off of that elevated highway, brought it out to the hatchery. And uh, the first year we did this, we had two treatments, so clean well water and then um, untreated stormwater runoff. Each of those large PVC tubes holds one adult salmon, one adult coho salmon. And they have um, 
uh, air and water flowing over their gills, so they're, uh, they're perfectly content to kind of get dozy and fall asleep inside those tubes. Uh, what we did was that after exposing them for a few hours, we took them out of those tubes, put them in clean water just so we could observe their behavior. Now in the control fish, we're seeing a very active, um, even possibly a little bit upset, uh, adult coho salmon. It's been confined for several hours. In contrast, the coho salmon that are exposed to the stormwater runoff after this amount of time, if they're still alive, um, often display these very same symptoms that we see in the wild fish that uh, after a storm event uh, in an urban area. So the, the loss of equilibrium in particular we're seeing in this, this individual. All right, so this is sort of the nature of the problem is what I've been describing up until now. And our research has been moving into, all right, we understand some of what the problem is. Um, let's start to work on what the solutions might be, you know, before we, before we you know, try to, you know, whatever. Science can, <laughs> science can work for a long, long time on the problem, but we, we definitely want to be working towards the solution. All right, so part of the solution, we think, is going to be green stormwater infrastructure. Lisa already went over this, these concepts. I'm not going to go into them more except to say that um, they, many of them uh, utilize bioretention, which is a way of getting the runoff to infiltrate into the soil and basically act, like we were saying uh, earlier, like the forest soil fil filters, you know, slow the runoff, spread it out, and soak it into the soil. So WSU in Puyallup has uh, an outdoor laboratory where there are various types of GSI. I call them GSI instead of LID. Same idea though, low impact development. And uh, the facility that I'm going to be talking about, the, the particular tool that we use for the research I'm showing you today is actually these, um, these large soil columns. So it's kind of halfway between the field and the lab. And um, I think of these as a, like a taking a core section through a rain garden. And most of that column contains the bioretention soil medium. And then there's a, a gravel drainage layer at the bottom. So a few years ago, we did our very first uh, biological effectiveness tests using these columns. We collected runoff from the, the elevated urban highway, brought it down to Puyallup, from Seattle to Puyallup. Um, we homogenized the runoff in this large mixing tank took off runoff that would then be the untreated, unfiltered runoff, and the rest of it went through the soil columns. So half of these columns had plants established in them, um, sedges, Carex placa, and the other half had nothing, just the bioretention soil media itself. We collected the runoff that came out the other end and then uh, sampled it for a ton of chemistry that's in our published papers and also the biological testing, which I'll talk about now. So this case, in addition to the zebrafish, which are very useful, we also wanted to test our target organisms. So one of those, of course, is the coho salmon. And um, at the WSU Puyallup Fish Lab, we have juvenile coho salmon that we can use for these tests. And we wanted to know whether, whether and what kind of toxicity we would see from the direct runoff and whether bioretention could prevent that toxicity. So here we have with a pretty standard toxicological approach, just looking for survival after exposure. So we have controls. Um, we have the unfiltered runoff and then the runoff that was filtered either with plants or without plants. Now in the, in the straight runoff, we actually saw 100% mortality within 12 hours of exposure. This, is, this, is, this standardized test lasts 96 hours. But within 12 hours, all of the fish in that, in that treatment were dead. Um, we were actually a little bit surprised by that, even though we know that salmon are very sensitive. Um, in the controls, 100% survival. Uh, no sickness and no, no mortalities at the end of the four-day period, the 96 hours. So what about the filtered water? If the unfiltered water can kill all the fish in less than 12 hours, you know, was this filtration going to work? And in fact, it did. We saw 100% survival with no sick fish at the end of the 96-hour period. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> we also um, did some invertebrate testing. We used um, wild mayflies that we collected uh, out of the Cedar River, actually. So that's also one of our, our target organisms of concern in terms of the food web of coho salmon. And we also tested Seriodaphnia dubia, which is um, the, invertebrate, the invertebrate we use for the more the, the lab side of things. And all of these, these three um, 
species are summarized in this figure that's uh, in one of our recently published papers. I forgot to put the, uh, the reference there, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a reference for that. So this figure is showing survival in each of the treatments. So survival of one being 100% everybody's alive. So 100% survival, um, or effectively that, for all of the controls for each of those species. In the unfiltered urban runoff exposure, 100% mortality for the, the Daphnid, um, and also for the juvenile coho, and very, very high rates of mortality for the mayflies as well. But in the treated runoff, didn't matter whether plants were there or not, you had 100% survival effectively for those treatments. Basically, that just means that the plants couldn't add anything more than 100% alive. All right, so what about sublethal impacts? You know, mortality is a pretty extreme endpoint when you're, when you're talking about aquatic toxicity. So in the, in the Daphnid, we uh, have a test that looks at reproductive impairment over a week-long period um, following exposure. Um, and here I'm showing the results for the control and then the two, treat, the two treated uh, tests with plants or without plants, not the untreated runoff because, of course, all of them had already died at this point. But would the treated water be different from the controls? And the answer is actually no. So at day five, there was a slight, uh, slightly lower reproductive output for the treated waters. But the end of the test um, where you're supposed to make this comparison is actually day seven. And you can see that all of those line up perfectly. And um, there was no impact on reproductive impairment. And this is a very, very sensitive test of toxicity. In terms of uh, the developing fish embryos, uh, we were also very curious whether any, um, any toxicity would come through those treatment columns. All right, so on the, um, these four metrics for the sublethal test are the inflation of the air bladder. So one means 100% inflation, or all the individuals had inflated air bladders. Fish size, pericardial area, so a bigger area means more swelling around the heart. And then eye area. You can see that for the fish exposed to the straight, untreated runoff, none of them had inflated swim bladders. They were all smaller than controls. They had swelling around their heart, and they had smaller eyes. But when we treated that runoff, again, uh, the addition of plants didn't provide any, any extra benefit. We see uh, normal air bladder inflation, normal size, normal hearts, and pretty much normalized. There was a slight significant reduction in eye size, but we don't know if that's um, biologically relevant. So huge improvements. Uh, one other thing that I want to go over, I won't take too much time on this, but um, we do have a set of molecular tools available to us. And we've been working at, uh, at developing that toolbox. So one of the things we can do is look for, look for certain enzymes or proteins that are being called into to action, I guess, by the, by the fish's detoxification system. So this one, CYP1A, this is actually a, a detoxification gene for the group of chemicals that includes polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. And what we can do is put a fluorescent, uh, fluorescent tracker on that protein. And when we shine a fluorescent light on it, it tells us where that enzyme, where that detox enzyme is being sent in the fish's body um, and how much there is. So this picture here shows a fish that's all lit up on the outside with green. And, and it might be hard to make sense of this, but here's its great big eye. The fish is pointing to the left, um, the great big yolk sac here. It's just the front half of the fish we're looking at. And this red up here is actually the muscle in its pectoral fin. Um, so control fish don't have any of this green staining. Here we're seeing the green staining all in the skin. And with this kind of microscopy, we can actually zoom in and look at um, something like just the heart region. So this image here is a zoom in of the heart region. The red staining is just where the heart physically is located. The green staining on the left is that outside skin of the fish being lit up with the detox enzyme. Um, but the important point of this picture is that there's detox enzyme inside the heart. So the endocardial tissues are actually being signaled to produce more of this detox enzyme because they're being exposed to a toxic chemical or a potentially toxic chemical. In fact, what we see when we do the bioretention treatment is um, some pretty interesting results that, that agree with what we see for the, for the morphometric. So uh, on the left here, we see the control situation. Uh, it's hard to make sense of what you're seeing at the top there because you don't see the outline of the fish. It's just showing the, the big red heart muscle because there is no green detox enzyme being, being called to action here.
And the bottom pictures for all of these is part of the tail section of the fish, so it's the trunk muscle that you're seeing. Again, no green staining. In the runoff, these, this is the picture I just showed you where you're seeing that staining in the fish's skin and also inside the heart tissues. And down in the trunk, you see that it's also all throughout the peripheral vasculature. So those are all the arteries and veins that, that are along the fish's trunk as well are lit up with this detox enzyme having been called into action. And the panel on the right is showing after the bioretention filtration. Um, at the bottom here, you see a little bit of green staining still in the peripheral vasculature, so in some of the, the arteries and veins on the periphery of the fish, but none inside the heart anymore. And that's, that's what's important, because that's what goes along, with, apparently, um, with the loss of the overt toxic symptoms. So this table summarizes all of these different tests that we did on the different animal models, different endpoints, different time of exposure. And you can see that bioretention has eliminated nearly all of these. Um, things like detox enzymes are still showing a, a little bit of induction, so a little bit of activity is still present, but that's what they're supposed to do is get, is get uh, induced when they're exposed to something. And if they're doing their job and they're not being overwhelmed by the flow of, of their workload, then there will be no toxic symptoms um, because they're able to detoxify. OK, so this research has been summarized in these two papers, which are, um, have all been published open access so that anyone can download them off of the internet. We can put a link to this in the, in the materials following the presentation. All right, now I want to bring this back around to, to the coho salmon story. So we wanted to know, could bioretention prevent the pre-spawn mortality that we know we can create by exposing them to stormwater runoff? And what we did for this experiment was create a portable bioretention system, basically just in 55-gallon drums. And we actually followed the Department of Ecology's guidelines for a bioretention system. So our mixture of the bioretention soil media is uh, 24 inches deep of a mixture of sand and compost. And then we have a, a, a layer of just bark mulch on top uh, to uh, hold moisture in. And then there's the gravel drainage layer on the bottom. These are pictures from out at Grover's Creek, where we brought the portable bioretention system. Uh, we helped them collect the salmon. It's one of our NOAA, NOAA colleagues there in the yellow jacket handling adult coho salmon. Um, and then the pictures on the right show water slowly infiltrating into our bioretention cells and then coming out after the treatment. So here was a third treatment added. We have 100% normal fish in the clean well water. We have 100% symptomatic or dead fish in the untreated runoff what's going to happen in the treated runoff. And we did this experiment across two separate years. In 2013 was the first time we did it. And uh, you may recall it didn't really rain that fall. <laughs> it didn't rain for a long time. So we were only able to get two separate um, trials through at the end of the spawning season in 2013. So in 2014, we hopped right on the bandwagon right at the beginning of the season and got an additional three exposures done to, to round out our sample numbers and, and really believe that what we were seeing was, was true and valid. This table summarizes those results. You could see that for 2013, that very first exposure we did was just four hours long. We saw no problems in the control water. We saw in the untreated runoff, we saw half of the fish were dead and half of them were sick, symptom, showing symptoms. And in the treated runoff, everybody was fine. But we were concerned that the same symptoms might, uh, might occur, just might take longer exposure. So we brought the exposure time out to 24 hours. We checked them at 4 hours and then again at 24 hours. And now the results are very clear that um, no problems in the controls. Everybody's alive and healthy. Everybody was dead in the untreated runoff. They'd gone past sick at 4 hours to dead, everybody dead by 24 hours. And then in the treated runoff, still at 24-hour time point, uh, all the fish were alive and none were symptomatic. So very encouraging. Here's a few videos of that, which mimic what I showed you a little bit ago um, in just the, the two treatment conditions. So there in the well water, the adult coho salmon is very uh, reactive, very responsive to its environment. In the unfiltered stormwater runoff, we're seeing two different, um, two different examples here. In the first one, the fish is just lethargic, not very responsive. And in the second one, the fish has now lost equilibrium, um, much like the other video I showed you earlier. 
And then finally, up here we have one example of a fish that's been through the filtered stormwater runoffs. This is the same runoff that causes the lethargy and the mortality in the bottom images. Um, and that fish is uh, through the bioretention filtration system, very reactive and very responsive, looking much like the well water situation. So very encouraging. I think this might be my summary slide. We're definitely seeing that urban stormwater runoff is a threat to aquatic ecosystems. We see multiple signs of toxicity, multiple symptoms across different fish and invertebrate species. And that includes mortality and cardiovascular toxicity in developing fish. We see mortality and reproductive impairment in aquatic invertebrates. And mortality in both juvenile and adult coho salmon. And then, of course, the the silver lining to that is this, this hopeful work that we're doing that shows that soil bioretention can, in fact, prevent this acute toxicity. There are a number of remaining questions, of course. This, this work is just beginning as far as our understanding of the biological effectiveness of stormwater runoff. Um, there are definitely remaining questions about the longevity of performance, the sizing questions, how much of this would you need to put in an area, and, and for how long would it continue to be effective at, at that uh, at that treatment rate. Um, and then optimization of, of the soil media for performance for those two metrics, of course. So the hope, obviously, is that over time, even though this is not a forest, uh, with mitigation and also source control will be really important as well. Um, we can help those systems act more like the forest. And these are the folks I need to thank. Um, but this will all be up on the web later if you want to peruse all of our collaborators and the people that we want to thank for their support. And how often do you have to change the bioretention substrates? So as far as changing out bioretention substrates, there, we don't know the answer to that yet. What I can tell you from existing literature is that bioretention soil media continue to perform really well in terms of chemistry, because that's what we know the most about in terms of chemistry for a very long time on the, on the scale of, of decades, to be sure, in terms of removal of metals, which is what most of the chemistry studies have um, focused on, um, and also evidence so far for hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, of course, can be microbiologically degraded in the soil, uh, whereas metals will simply accumulate in the soil and perhaps be taken up by plants as far as where they go over time. We do expect that eventually bioretention soil substrates would have to be replaced, but, um, but it might be quite a bit longer than most of us are thinking. So Anne asks, are there any studies on existing bioretention infrastructures and their continuing impact on water body quality and existence of pollutants? And I, I will tell you what, what I know about that. Um, and I'm sure in the, in the gray literature, there's probably a lot more. But in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, we could probably put up, um, put up later on the website associated with this some, some studies related to that on, on what we know about the water quality coming out of um, bioretention systems, for example. Um, and so Oakland said you mentioned that you tried to create stormwater in the lab, but that there was no effect on salmon. Are you working towards or have you determined what the effective compound is in the actual stormwater that you were not able to recreate in the lab? It's an interesting question. Yeah, great question. Uh, so um, the various tools we've employed so far, and I certainly did not cover them all in this talk today, are pointing towards organic contaminants rather than the metals per se. You know, metals may add to that toxicity, but it does not appear that metals alone are causing the toxic symptoms that we see. Instead, it looks like it's something organic because it does degrade pretty rapidly over time. Um, we are working towards understanding what those compounds are. Uh, we've got some projects that we're designing uh, and uh, going to be starting up here pretty soon. But it is, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult, uh, pretty difficult problem to tackle. Um, just in terms of chemistry, you know, we spend, I, I'm, I'm not even going to try to guess right now, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, obviously, for just measuring the chemistry in these storms. And we're just barely measuring the tip of the iceberg of the contaminants that are actually present in the stormwater that could be causing the toxic effects. So, there's certainly a lot of work to do. So Jen, do you want to say something also about your work on pollution prevention and green chemistry, which um, is a good way to address avoiding the problems to begin with? Just maybe a moment. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure how much of this is. Anyhow, so uh, one of the projects that we're just undertaking is with um, 
just a little pilot test actually with Department of Ecology. They're interested in uh, they're interested in exploring green stormwater, uh, sorry, not green stormwater infrastructure, but green chemistry, which uh, the purpose of green chemistry is actually to design out contaminants from products that are used in the environment such that when they interact with the environment, they won't release these, uh, these chemicals that can cause problems. Um, and we're doing a little pilot test with them for some uh, bumper materials, which sometimes are, are just old truck tires, right? Uh, and we have another study ongoing that, um, that's looking at the toxicity of tires itself in terms of uh, that's a really large component, usually more than up to around, well, I'll just say around 50% of the dust that's in road surfaces, for example, is tire dust. And we know there's a lot of toxic chemicals in that. And certainly those could be what are causing the effects we see on the fish. <laughs>